The gentleman from California, Mr. Royce, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, uh, watching the, the trends in the market for Treasuries, it appears as though the two major creditors, which would be Japan and China, have begun to scale back their purchases of U.S. government securities. And filling the void in demand have been other foreign governments uh, or other foreigners, as they say, who I, I'd assume that would be foreign banks and hedge funds, and then also uh, would be U.S.-based financial institutions. Clearly, there is market play here. Um, the, the, the carry trade is in effect here by these banks, which essentially amounts to borrowing at next to nothing from central banks and lending it back to the U.S. government at 1 or 2 percent, depending on how far out they go on the yield curve. Have we backed ourselves into a corner here? Essentially, if you raise interest rates, the carry trade evaporates, as does the demand in the Treasury market and our ability to finance the $1.5 trillion deficit this year. So who's going to lend to us if we do that? And uh, if foreign governments are scaling back and financial institutions can no longer make money in this market, where will the demand for Treasuries come from? Well, this is a very large and deep market. And indeed, when you see um, stress in other areas around the world, you know, perhaps uh, you know, in other, other countries' uh, fiscal positions, for example, the dollar tends to strengthen because money flows uh, into U.S. Treasuries. Um, I haven't seen any, any reduction in demand for uh, U.S. Treasuries. The foreign demand remains quite strong. Um, and uh, I anticipate, I don't anticipate any problem. I guess there's always the question of price. And there the question is, will all our creditors, including domestic creditors, uh, remain confident in the long-run fiscal stability of the United States? And there I think it's very, very important for the Congress to be devising a plan to create a trajectory whereby we have a more stable uh, debt position going forward. That's very important. And I concur on the points you've made on, on, on that publicly. But getting back to the question of the extent that we are dependent upon the carry trade to finance our debt, do you, do you think there's an element of, uh, of truth to, the, to that point? I, there's sometimes uh, the misunderstanding that the carry trade is a an arbitrage or a pure, pure profit opportunity. It's not, because when you borrow to buy a long-term security, you're taking sure. on uh, considerable risk associated with the longer-term uh, life of the, uh, of the security. So I think what will happen is that if short-term interest rates go up because uh, the economy strengthens, then long-term rates might go up as well. Um, and that would affect our cost of financing our deficit and another reason to get the deficit under good control. But the interest rate will do what is necessary to attract the demand for our securities. And I, again, I, I don't see any reason to think there won't be demand for those securities. And let me ask a question of Mr. Volcker, too. Um, with the introduction of Mr. Dodd's legislation in the Senate, we now have regulatory reform bills in each chamber that institutionalizes rather than eliminates this too big to fail concept, and the ultimate cost of too big to fail will be borne by our capital markets and the broader economy. The approach put forward in these bills essentially bifurcates our financial system, uh, and those institutions that will be labeled systemically significant will likely see lower borrowing costs and greater access to capital compared to their smaller competitors. And that would give these firms a significant competitive advantage. This is what happened with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They wiped out the competition and they formed a duopoly over the prime secondary mortgage market because they were perceived to be government backed. So Mr. Volcker, are we recreating the moral hazard problem found at Fannie and Freddie by labeling these institutions too big to fail, and how would you expect creditors and counterparties of these institutions to react to this label or even making the label official? Mr. Volker? 
Well, when you talk about Fannie and Freddie in particular and the moral hazard and the mortgage market and the moral hazard with respect to those institutions, I think it is very real and it will be a real challenge to change that in the future. I don't, you're not going to do it right now. The mortgage market is wholly dependent or if not wholly dependent, mostly dependent on government participation, including support for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So you're stuck with it. But I don't think we want to get ourselves in that position in the future. And I, I hope that's on your agenda next year and we reorganize the mortgage market. So far as other financial institutions are concerned, I hope your opening comment that both bills institutionalized too big to fail is not correct. Uh, I understand your concern about labeling an institution implicitly as too big to fail, and I don't want to do that, which is part of the reason hiding behind, and we're not hiding behind, in the forefront of the kind of proposal I make. I do not want that presumption to exist, particularly for non-banks. I want it to exist for banks as little as possible. But the banks do have access to the Federal Reserve. I don't think we're going to change that. They do have deposit insurance. And they also are heavily regulated. And that's the balance. So they don't have that much competitive advantage. The other ones, I don't want to have any competitive advantage. Uh, if they're extremely vulnerable, they will get some regulation. But they should not have any expectation that they're going to be bailed out. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Wilker. Behind my concerns. I understand. The gentleman's time has expired, gentlemen.